so in terms of our flagship project, which is the Apothecary Micro Lab, we're now in version four. And this is an open source automated chemical reactor that you can build with off the shelf parts and you can use it to manufacture drugs. And you know, we've had a lot of versions of this before, but this fourth version is really exciting because it's really, really easy to build. It doesn't require soldering. Everything snaps together or mm. plugs together. Um, it's self-contained. It doesn't have to run off of a computer. It has its own internal computer. There's a touch screen that talks you through every step, uh, holds your hand. So you have a little assistant helping you in the lab as you go through. It does all of the things that are easy for a human to get wrong, but very easy for a computer to keep an eye on. Mm. And, and then it asks you for help for the things that are easy for a human, but very difficult for a perfunctory kind of robot to do. And there's a whole suite of software that now goes along with it, which is really nice. It uh, has to be run by a program. You have to have a program file for generating a particular drug. There's now, instead of having to code that, now there's a graphical user interface that you can generate that file knowing what has to happen chemically. Mm -hmm. And antecedent to that, there's also our new online system that runs on our supercomputer called Chemhactica that crawls through all of the chemical literature over the past few hundred years and works combinatorially to try and find a synthesis pathway for you within whatever parameters you give it. Um, and of course it's open source, so you can fork it and do with it as you will. If you also have a computer that's capable of handling such a very process intensive piece of software and antecedent to that, we have uh, put together a sort of virtual research assistant that will help you crawl through the um, scientific literature when you're trying to figure out what sort of a drug you'd like to generate for some given ailment that you're trying to address. So this is a whole suite of software that we have, and it's, mm. it's really exciting that we're going to be able to show it to the public really soon. Does that expand the types of drugs that can be produced or are these... Well, it's still limited to what I would call small molecule chemistry. Okay. It's in, you, it does expand it insofar as you no longer have to either wait for us to come up with some program for mm -hmm. synthesis of the drug of your choice, um, nor do you have to work for several months with a team of really gifted retrosynthesis organic chemists what you can do is you can use the software and then just get a, a vaguely competent chemist to sort of walk you through some options. And, you know, maybe in a day or a weekend, you should be able to find a, a synthesis pathway. So it does expand things in that regard. The classes of things that you can make chemically are still kind of restricted to small molecule chemistry. If you're trying to make something that's a macromolecule, like insulin, this isn't going to do it. You really need to delve into the world of biochemistry for that, it's, mm. which is complicated in a different way. Yeah, speaking of insulin, I just want to comment on this because um, I feel like out of all the kind of comments I see of like, hey, you all need to start figuring out how to make insulin because everyone need. I mean, obviously, there's so many people that need insulin and it's... yeah expensive often uh to attain and for no reason yeah and for no reason right yeah um, i mean yeah it, i think i get the three the three main things that we get letters about are hey what about insulin and i always say go talk to the open insulin project this is a very difficult problem and they've been working on it for about a decade mm -hmm. they're getting close mm -hmm. go give them all of your expertise and all of your resources mm -hmm. because they're the ones who are going to get it done um, I get asked about HRT a lot, um, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. which uh, again is it's, it's a little less complicated because, you know, hormones are not macromolecules. Um, and there are some things that you can do with that. Um, I guess those are the top two. Those are the top two that yeah. I hear about people like insulin, HRT, um, you know, and then 
birth control related stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just think for me as someone who's a a complete layman, when it comes to this, I'm like, yeah, like what are the things that people need right now? Make those first. And then you're like, well, let me, I can't. (laughs) It's just not, we don't have the ability to I would love to. to. Let me tell you, I would love to. Right. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is like, uh, and I know, I know Anthony DeFranco who runs the open insulin project pretty well. We're, we're close friends and he's just a wonderful and brilliant brilliant guy Mm -hmm. um and watching what he's done over the years is incredibly humbling Mm. that he he has a single goal and a single project and it is extremely extremely difficult um from a technical standpoint from a legal standpoint from an infrastructural standpoint it like everything about what he's doing is so difficult and is so important like that that is the, the number one that mm-hmm. is the top of in terms of you want to see people like just numbers of people who are very ill and or dying from lack of access to basic medications that one tops the list i think mm-hmm. anthony he did some back of the envelope calculation showing that um insulin starvation in diabetics is killing the same, killing at the same rate as it was, as soldiers were dying at the height of the Second World War. Mm. And it is so bizarre to think about how the entire world rallied to <laughs> try and stop the Second World War. But if people are just dying in ones and twos, and it's not, you know, then, then, then why rally? Yeah, you know, that's a great point because I, I feel like with like the pandemic, I mean, we're seeing on average somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 a week dying, I believe, across the United States from COVID. Um, at certain points, it's higher when there's a surge, you know, the lagging indicator of hospitalizations and so on. Um, well, over a million people in the U.S. have died from COVID. So it's like, that's yeah. significant. That's a huge number. That's a big... And then you talk about the percentage of people that are becoming disabled as a result of the long COVID that comes from uh, infection. Well, okay. Let's talk about that for a second. I sure. think that long COVID is really important. And I think it's um, it's very poorly understood and it's often really dismissed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which mm-hmm. really, really bothers me. Absolutely. Uh, part of part of the problem is that long COVID is very poorly defined, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Long COVID basically is this umbrella term that we use for anybody who had COVID and continues to suffer long after the week or two that people normally have what we would call acute symptoms, right? Mm-hmm. And we have these people who are continuing to suffer. And, and some of these things are irrevocable where somebody just had a really bad case and they got organ damage Mm -hmm. and if you have organ damage like it's very hard to reverse organ damage that's Mm -hmm. just that's just bad and okay that counts as that's sure that counts as long covid yeah um Mm -hmm. there are other ways that it manifests one of the things that i found in talking with some western trained ama doctors is that they have they tend to have an attitude that is very reminiscent of the sorts of reactions that you hear doctors have toward things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, where they're kind of like, oh, you really just need to lead a healthier lifestyle and those will go away. You know, like lose some weight or exor- something. You need to exercise yeah. more. You need to lose weight. You, you should, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. um, and this this very dismissive, like, oh, I think this is psychosomatic. And there was one guy who was willing to have a slightly more in-depth conversation with me about it. When I kind of nailed him to the wall about it, the I realized that the the reason for this attitude with things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue was like, well, we don't know how to fix it. So it doesn't really exist. 
you know, and, and it wasn't quite that, but that was clearly how it was being thought of. It was this idea of like, well, we don't have structures to diagnose this or to treat it. So why are you bothering me? Yeah. And in my mind, I was like, well, what you should be saying is, I'm so sorry, we're just not that sophisticated as a species yet to have technology to address this. We don't understand what's going on. We wish we did. We can try some stuff, but nothing we know works reliably. Mm -hmm. That seems like an honest way to deal with this sort of thing. But Mm -hmm. on the flip side, instead, because Western medicine seems to imbue doctors with this incredible omniscient hubris of well we know how the human body works Mm -hmm. and i mean i was trained as a scientist and if you're honest with yourself what you need to cop to if you're actually going to be a scientist is that you're never going to understand anything what you're going to do is you're going to tell yourself a number of really compelling just so stories which might or might not have the capability of predicting some things and we have some very fancy mathematics and some symbols that often do this very very well but as i like to say the big bang is just our creation myth. And don't get me wrong, it's my favorite too because we can do a lot with it. Yeah. But let's not shit ourselves. We mm-hmm. don't know. Mm-hmm. We don't know how the universe started. We don't know how it works. And we certainly don't understand things as complicated as biology. We have a lot of good correlations and we figured a lot more out than we knew a few hundred years ago. Yeah. And we have these sort of mechanisms of action where we can connect point A to point B, but we don't really know. And, and so there's this very disappointing attitude of like, well, we don't know, so it must not be real. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? And so in the same way, when people are saying, look, I got COVID and I don't have as much energy as I used to, or I got COVID and I react very weirdly to simple sugars Mm -hmm. or I got COVID and now I have cognitive problems Mm -hmm. and it gets blown off and blown off and blown off. And it, I think it's just a travesty because these people are suffering. And we're talking about the fact that COVID has sired an entire generation of people who are going to be suffering for the rest of their lives. If this goes unaddressed. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'm pretty excited about in terms of announcements is that there was a researcher who found a way to address one of these presentations of long COVID. And, and he called me out of the blue and said, Hey, this isn't getting any traction. Maybe you can slip it in through the back door. Here's my documentation do with it what you will. Mm -hmm. And it's actually fairly simple, but again, very hard to access for all of the sorts of reasons you would expect. Mm -hmm. One of the ways that long COVID seems to present with some frequency is as an autoimmune disorder Mm -hmm. that like people will get COVID, their immune system rallies to try to fight off the infection. And then because it's working so hard and nothing's happening, it just can never turn off. And you basically have this perpetual inflammatory response that won't go away and everything's really hard and you you have no energy and you're sort of, you know, all of the things that autoimmune things have. And so how do you treat an autoimmune disease? Well, you try and modulate the immune system down with immunosuppressives. Mm -hmm. And if you look, at the very few doctors who have had the compassion to actually listen to their patients and try to do something and experiment and went with what is known about it, that it seems to be autoimmune and have treated them with immunosuppressants, it's been fairly successful, which is pretty cool. The problem is, is that immunosuppressives are pretty rough on the system Mm -hmm. and 
you know, when you're in a plague, the last thing that you want is a compromised immune system. And it's very hard to decide, like, how do you do this? And, mm. um, and the sets of immunosuppressives that are available in the United States are very few. And oftentimes people aren't eligible for them because they're so hard on the kidneys, they'll literally just kill you. Mm. Um, so what he brought to our attention is that there is a drug which was approved by the FDA many, many years ago that was originally a drug for leprosy. Hmm. And if you think about that, of course, it kind of doesn't make sense. You think, okay, well, leprosy, this should be an antibiotic. That's a bacterial infection. Why would this have? Well, as it turns out, its mechanism of action modulates, um, I believe it's the calcium channels inside T cells and will suppress the immune system. Hmm. And the beauty of this drug is that it's very, very well tolerated. Uh, sometimes people get skin rashes, and that's about the worst of the side effects that it gives. You can't get it in the US anymore, however. It's not manufactured here and it's not imported here because leprosy is considered a poor people problem or a non white people problem. Mm. And so this drug has been in production for 70 years or something or longer, but if you want it, you have to make a deal with somebody in India or Nepal or Bangladesh um, mm. to get it. But the the good news is that if you do have one of these autoimmune presenting versions of long COVID, it's not like you have to take a bunch of it before you see if it works. And it's not like you have to take it for the rest of your life. You simply take one or two doses and it'll modulate your immune system down quickly enough that you'll know in a day or two whether it's working. So maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but you don't have to go through some massive course of treatment in hopes that it'll do something. You'll know very quickly and you don't have to wait for it to take a toll on your system or to see how well you tolerate it. Mm. And then if it does turn out that it works, then you can just take it regularly for about a month and that will bring your immune system back to a more natural set point. And then you can stop taking it and you'll be back to normal, which is just... Mm inspires such hope in me. Yeah. So we're, we're working to get um, access to this drug for a bunch of people and, and hopefully we can find ways that people can get it fairly easily. Mm -hmm.